One of the privileges of ordained ministry is walking alongside people during life's transitions and hardships, a birth, a death, a divorce, a family crisis. I've been ordained so long now that most of my early pastoral memories are gauzy and incomplete. However, one remains as clear as day. A parishioner by the name of Barbara was in the final weeks of her life following a long battle with cancer. We enjoyed gentle visits in the sanctuary of her home with beautiful conversations that were meaningful to her about things that mattered, life and family, important memories. She was a wonderful person. Her family, on the other hand, was a hot mess. They were out of control, and they deeply worried her. One evening, I received a call from Barbara's daughter. I should come if I am able. Mom is at the end. When I arrived at the house, there were several cars in the driveway. Everyone close to Barbara was there. Her best friend, Pat, her daughter, three adult sons, and ex-husband, Russ. As I approached the house, I heard some of the most blood-curdling, violent screaming I had ever heard in my life, the kind you hear in a Quentin Tarantino film. Two of the brothers were in the living room having a fist fight. There were tables turned over, a, ta- a, a chair had been smashed, some knickknacks that had been broken. Sister was there in the middle of it trying to stop them. Uh, the third brother was in the backyard having a smoke while Mr. X was in the kitchen self medicating. Thank God for Pat, who stayed sentinel at the bedside of Barbara. So I'm like, all right. (laughs) So I put my big boy pants on and went in the living room and I said to the boys, maybe mom should have some peace and we could take this outside. And with that, one of them pushed me so hard that I lost my balance and I tripped over a chair and fell on the ground. He told me to mind my business. And he had one of those hunting knives in his pocket. Thankfully, a neighbor heard all this and called the cops. And I don't mind saying that I was relieved when they came, shaken, but relieved. Over nearly 25 years of ministry, I have experienced a dizzying array of human emotion and intensity. I've witnessed the underbelly of humanity many times. However, this was the closest I had ever come to feeling as though I was in real physical danger. In the language of modern psychology, I did not feel safe. The home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus had always been a safe place for Jesus. They were not officially on the books as his disciples. However, by all accounts, they were among his closest friends. Bethany was that place where Jesus could flip off his sandals, put his feet up, have a beer, and be himself. All of that has radically changed in today's gospel. Like Barbara's home, on that dreadful night all those years ago, what had been a sanctuary had become a war zone. Just a few chapters earlier in John's Gospel, we read about Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. And news of that miracle has spread far and wide. And his acclaim has come to the attention of the chief priests and the elders who are actively seeking his arrest. 
If this is supposed to be a celebratory meal for Lazarus' re-entrance into the land of the living, it is all happening squarely under a massive dark cloud. His death is inevitable. Lazarus, now alive, there in the room, sharing a meal, but he is not safe either, and nor are his sisters. They are harboring a criminal. As if tensions could not rise any higher, Judas has become caustic, launching into a biting put-down of Mary, and Jesus gets his back up, and the two of them go at it, infusing the scene with a sense of chaos and the feeling that in this room, no one is safe. Then there is this hush. No shouting, no, shouting, no rancor, not a clanking of a dish or glass. All becomes absolutely silent, still. A bottle is broken open. The fragrance of spikenard wafts through the air, 300 denarii worth, and Mary pours the whole of it, does not hold back one drop, upon Jesus' feet. She is there anointing the anointed one. And the sweet fragrance of this moment has become the new narrative. And John shines a spotlight upon it, upon this moment, revealing this circle of light that is there. And it's just Jesus who looks upon Mary with a heart burning full of love and Mary feeling so absolutely safe in the light-filled circle of Jesus' embrace safe enough to let her hair down and pour out all of her love. Years ago, I attended a preaching conference at Duke University. And one of the presenters was a Presbyterian minister from Colorado and she she shared a story about her dog and I'm pretty sure his name was Buster. And she said, every time I pull out a bottle of doggy shampoo and say, hey, Buster, it's time for your bath, Buster bends his head low and heads immediately down the hallway to the stairs and sits upon the third step. Not the first step, not the tenth step, not the fourth step, the third step. And she said, whenever Buster is being naughty and I say to him, bad dog, Buster, Buster heads down the hall, down to the stairs, and sits on that third step. When it thunders and lightnings outside, where are you going to find Buster? On the third step. The preacher called it Buster's safe step. It's the place where Buster feels safe and secure, even though there is something scary getting ready to happen. There are many safe steps in the world. Indeed, the world can be a scary and chaotic place. Do you know that right now there are millions of people on the move all over this globe, displaced from the sanctity of their homes and communities by war, corrupt governments, and the effects of climate change. Sacred places of nurture and refuge, such as schools and houses of worship and community centers, have been violated again and again by senseless acts of gun violence. At our recent Courageous Conversation series here in Branson Hall, Our presenter, David Bernstein, told us this, and it just chilled me to the bone. Of all of the children and youth in the sex trafficking ring globally, 70%, 70% come directly 
from the foster care system. But I don't need to tell you how scary the world can be. The gospel writer John knew it, just as you do, just as I do. Life is difficult, M. Scott Peck's Peck said all those years ago in the opening line of his book, The Road Less Traveled, three truer words have never been spoken. So where do we go? Where do we find ourselves? Where is our safe step when life's hardships come our way? Indeed, when you get right down to it, as our biblical story attests over and over again, there is only one real safe place, that is, in the holy embrace of the one whose heart burns with love for us. John gives us this beautiful picture of how it is between Jesus and Mary, and I think he gives it to us to show us how it can be between us and Jesus. Is that not what this Lenten journey is all about? After all, isn't it about living more deeply into the embrace of the one whose heart burns with love for us? However, I think this scene that John sets is not just about us, but is also a beautiful vision for what a church can and should be, a safe step upon which we can all find ourselves, locate ourselves, a refuge where we can come to draw strength from God and one another, a home where we are anointed with the power of God to renew us in our own self-worth and dignity, so that we might be that love and to be that light and to go out those doors and to push that love to, into every place where God's people live in fragility and fear so that the whole world is resting in that safe place too. The signs and symbols of Holy Week are all here, foreshadowed in our hearing this morning. They are surrounding us. They are floating in and through this room, inviting us to walk the way forward onto Jerusalem, forward to Jerusalem. The threat of violence a final meal with friends, the washing of feet, the witness of courageous women, the smell of death, a light-filled safe place when the world goes dark, and the sweet, sweet fragrance of love filling the air. Amen.